In 1947, Princess Elizabeth made a prophetic coming-of-age speech. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Little did she know that six years later she would be crowned queen. This inexperienced young woman would be propelled onto the world stage to take Britain from its imperial past to a Commonwealth future. I'm going to explore how Queen Elizabeth's role as the head of the Commonwealth helped define her as a person. As she transformed from a young mother... The Queen was pretty shy. Her mother wrote letters. Keep your chipper up, keep smiling, the people want to see you. To a monarch in command. Her length of time in that position and her ability to listen and talk to those leaders is virtually unique. And how she in turn helped build the Commonwealth we know today. I hereby declare the Commonwealth Games open. Being bold on the world stage in a way she couldn't at home. Do you think Margaret Thatcher felt she'd somehow been hijacked? Yeah. By the Queen. By her queen. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel enormously proud of what the Commonwealth has achieved and all of it within my lifetime. I'm going to follow in the Queen's footsteps, well, some of them anyway. I'm going to find out just how she shaped the Commonwealth and, well, how it has shaped her. June 1953. The world's leaders descend on Westminster Abbey to witness the coronation of Elizabeth II. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. Celebrations were organized in Britain's far-flung imperial territories. Hip, hip. But in truth, the British Empire was nearing its end. India, the jewel in Britain's crown, had already won its independence. A new institution was emerging, the Commonwealth, made up of former colonies that had fought for freedom. I was born in Sri Lanka. I spent my childhood in Ghana. I've worked in South Africa and, of course, Britain is my home. They're all linked together, they're all Commonwealth countries, but I never thought of them as being linked together by the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. The role was thrust upon her after the untimely death of her father. It had just eight members, all former British colonies, including Australia, Canada, South Africa and India. This voluntary club gave new members an equal voice and opportunities for trade. But still in its infancy, it now fell to the young queen to make it succeed in a volatile world. With the coronation barely over, the queen was dispatched on the longest tour ever undertaken by a monarch. For six months, she would be away from her two young children. So it was for the new head of the Commonwealth that a Commonwealth journey was planned. The Queen would set foot in many lands. Newfoundland, Bermuda, Jamaica, Panama, Fiji Islands, Tonga, New Zealand, Australia, Ceylon, Aden and Uganda, Malta and Gibraltar. The Queen would circle the entire globe visiting Commonwealth nations, British protectorates and colonies. Stand by for takeoff. Her mission? To promote the Commonwealth and be accepted in her new role. She sailed the Pacific to reach the furthest corner of the Commonwealth. 
determined to squeeze in a visit to the tiny protectorate of Tonga. I've done an awful lot of traveling in my time, but I've never been out here. We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, literally on the other side of the world. Just imagine what it was like for the Queen back in 1953. You know, it was her personal decision to come here to Tonga, and it was all down to a very unlikely friendship. Her Majesty Queen Salote, six foot three ruler of the Tonga Islands in the South Pacific. Obviously delighted to be here for the great occasion, Queen Salote first met Queen Elizabeth in London at the coronation six months earlier. She'd travelled over 10,000 miles, a gesture not forgotten by the Queen. It is a simple meeting, this. Our royal family of Tonga waiting there for Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. The Queens are together at last. The friendship between our two countries is renewed. Now, if anything takes you back to that royal trip of 1953, it's this. This is the car in which the Queen travelled through the streets of Tonga. Even on such a remote island, the crowds were out in force to catch a glimpse of the new monarch. Princess Pilolevu was a young girl at the time of Queen Elizabeth's visit. My grandmother moved out. Hold on, your grandmother, Queen Salote, moved out of the royal palace to allow Queen Elizabeth to use it? Yes. <laughs> it's a small palace, maybe one of the smallest palaces <laughs> in the world. Your Royal Highness, I've brought some archive. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, tell no, me how. No, I've never seen it, and yeah. in color. You haven't seen it? No, oh, well, it's look, amazing. Um... There's my father. I remember my nanny taking me downstairs in the royal palace, dressed to the nines, but told to be very quiet, right. <laughs> to so behave. What, what, what were they worried about? Well, that one of us would, you know, scream out at the top of our lungs with our hands pointed, oh, look, that's the British Queen, or something <laughs> in Tongan. Did Queen Salote ever talk about the way our Queen uh, looked? I remember Queen Salote saying, She's British, she's not Tongan, so she's able to keep the same figure <laughs> because they don't eat Tongan food in England. <laughs> well, talking about Tongan food, of course, one of the things Queen Elizabeth had to do was to preside over a feast, which is a big thing in Tongan culture. Well, they're sitting on the floor, are they? Yes, they are. The Duke of Edinburgh sat cross-legged. He must have been very fit. The table is groaning with food. Yes. The food is served on huge banana leaves. Two thousand pigs, hundreds of chickens, lobsters have been prepared. The feast works out at about two pigs per head. Did Queen Salote talk about how our queen coped? She said she coped very well. She did taste everything. The young queen born into the British aristocracy seemed adept at taking in a new culture. This Commonwealth tour, the first one we did, was the longest one we've, we've ever done. Well, of course, it was very interesting being able to go and see the people who'd come to the coronation, see them in their own countries, like um, going to Tonga and, and visiting the, the Queen of Tonga in her own country. I mean, crossing the Pacific in, in, in a ship, which one never does nowadays, was an experience in itself. Three weeks at sea. I stuck in all the pictures and photographs in my photograph album, which I'd never have done otherwise. Extraordinary to look back on, isn't it? But after Tonga, the Queen was to face a far greater challenge. Sydney Harbour came in sight. 
that great harbour, one of the wonders of the world, alive with people and decorated boats. Australia, an influential founding member of the Commonwealth. With the organisation still being established, it was vital that young Queen win over this vast nation. It started here. She sailed into Sydney Harbour on the 3rd of February 1954. She was the first reigning monarch to do so. And she came here as the Queen of Australia. This, all this, was her realm. Every major city was included in a gruelling two-month itinerary. The idea was to be seen by as many Australians as possible to strengthen bonds with Britain. Queen was about to be very publicly scrutinised. If you can imagine this whole foreshore thronged, everywhere you could find a space. Miles Farwell was six years old when he first saw the Queen. Oh, well, it was almost like a goddess descending from Mount Olympus. That's <laughs> wonderful. Listening to you, it's as if you were describing a kind of uh, mania. Why were people so excited? George, so many people here had a parent or a grandparent born in the United Kingdom. When we were at school, we learned about the kings and queens. We related to all the pink countries on the map of uh, the empire of the empire absolutely standing at last on Australian soil on this spot that is the birthplace of the nation I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia The city spent nearly two million pounds on the decorations. It was incredibly lavish. And all along the Royal Route, this road, other roads across Sydney, people camped overnight just to catch a glimpse of the Queen. The world's media added to the intense scrutiny. They weren't called paparazzi then, but their job was the same. Record every detail. And nowhere demonstrates this better than the archives of the Australian Women's Weekly. George, hello. Welcome to the Weekly. Editor Juliet Ryden has a treasure trove of images and stories from the time. That 54 tour, because it was such a long tour, the Queen was our cover girl for weeks and weeks on end. Right. I've seen some archive of this speech. It was very interesting because she read that speech without looking up once. Yes, well, I mean, this was her first speech of the tour. Yeah. The Queen was pretty shy. She yeah. was just 27. But see, that, that kind of tells you how much pressure she was under. She was on show all the time, couldn't let her guard down. Definitely, couldn't let her guard down at all. And of course, a lot of it was also about what she was wearing and was it all right? There are so many things to worry about when people are watching you under that scrutiny. One of the big things that you have to do, of course, is smile a lot. A huge strain, I would have thought. A, a huge strain, but she would have been taught well by her mother. Her mother wrote her a lot of letters about two things. One, the children back home and how they're going because the Queen Mother was looking after them. And the other about keep, keep your chipper up, make sure you're seen, that's why you're there. Keep smiling that the people want to see you. That 54 tour, the pace of it is incredible, with cars and boats and planes. And the Royal Train, you know, had this amazing observation carriage at the back. And Lady Pamela Hicks, the Queen's Lady-in-Waiting on this tour, said that on that Royal Train, there were times in the middle of the night when the Queen thought she should get up because people had gathered on stations. So she would sit up in her nightie and wave out of the window. <laughs> And that's what every royal tour is about, their charm offensives. We had our hands full, I can tell you. The transport people in every state said it was one of the biggest mass movements since the war. Children across the country were marshalled into attending mass rallies. It's 
just epic. I can't imagine how many rehearsals they would have had to have to do that. I mean, it's an awful thing to say, but it sort of reminds me of one of those orchestrated events you you get in some in some communist state. And I suppose it was part of a plan to make sure that every generation got to see the Queen and, and be affected by the by the by the magic of monarchy. I am very glad that I have had this opportunity of meeting so many of the children in my first visit to Australia. For it is you who will guard the safety and guide the destiny of this country in the years to come. Will Her Majesty accept a small token, Australian Thrupney bits for Prince Charles and Princess Anne? The Queen's trip was relentless. Over eight weeks in Australia, she took 33 flights, spending nearly 60 hours in the air, visiting some unlikely destinations. Broken Hill, I can tell you, is a long way from anywhere. I was looking out the window last night on the flight, and there's virtually nothing out there. And it makes you wonder why the Queen came here. And the clue is in the street names. Broken Hill is a mining town. Mining is its business. For local historian Christine Adams, the visit showed the Queen was making an effort to touch the lives of ordinary working people. It, it was really something that brightened them, their, their spirits because this city is a harsh city, but in the 50s it was even a harder place to live. We had men being killed on mines, and quite often there was someone that you knew had died. So for a queen to say, I'm coming to see you, uh, that was something. had to be something very, very special. With a visit from the queen, it really put the city on the map. So it was always going to be an advantage to our mining companies who had a great connection to England at that time. So, uh, so for them, it was almost like a sort of huge amount of publicity for that. Oh, yes, of course it was. Yeah. So look at the face yeah. of the men, all smiling. An estimated 75% of the Australian population turned out to see the Queen in 1954 revealing just how successful she'd been in winning over the people. By the end of her first Commonwealth tour, she'd visited over 10 countries, representing the new progressive organization. But success had come at a personal cost. The Queen and Prince Philip had missed out on six months of their children's lives. Prince Charles was five years old, and Princess Anne just three. Her predecessors had travelled enormously. That was the expectation. And they'd been away for very long times, and that was, again, part of the expectation. And, of course, it was, it was made worse by, the, by her father dying so early on in her career that she didn't have the option, really, to spend more time at home. By 1961, the Queen had given birth to her third child, Prince Andrew. And the Commonwealth had expanded too. As old colonies gained independence, it had grown from eight to 12 members. One of these was Ghana, the first black African colony to win independence. And the first to join the Commonwealth. With several other African colonies on the verge of winning their struggle for independence, Britain wanted to show they too had a future in the Commonwealth. If the Queen embraced Ghana's independence, she'd be showing the way. But this new challenge was going to require more than a shy smile and a glamorous wardrobe. I remember coming here to Accra with my family in 1961. I went to primary school in this city. We were the first generation to be taught under a black president. 
There were high hopes that Queen Elizabeth would come to the country that year. But then came some troubling news reports. The president of Ghana was this man, Kwame Nkrumah. Just four years after independence, he'd been locking up his opponents and there'd been a backlash. There were explosions around Accra and a statue of the president had been damaged. There were two aspects to the controversy. First of all, fears for the Queen's safety following the dynamite incidents in Accra, and secondly, the current political situation, which now bears very little resemblance to our ideas of a parliamentary democracy. The timing couldn't have been worse. Back in Britain, some said the Queen would be propping up an unpopular leader if she came here. The Prime Minister, Macmillan, well, he thought the visit would be just too dangerous. The Queen was having none of it, arguing that cancelling the trip would reflect badly on her as head of the Commonwealth. Apparently, she didn't want to be seen behaving like some film star, flouncing out at the merest hint of trouble. One account has her telling Prime Minister Macmillan, don't forget, I have three children. The message was clear, it wasn't a decision she was taking lightly. Macmillan was so concerned, he dispatched a member of his cabinet to recce the trip. Hurriedly, the Commonwealth Secretary flew to Ghana to examine the security arrangements. It was decided that he would drive along the route the Queen would be taking. He was accompanied by none other than the President, Nkrumah himself. It was a risky strategy, but the president wanted to prove the streets were safe and the queen would come to no harm in his company. This was a bold move. The slightest hint of trouble and the royal visit would have been called off. The queen's former private secretary, Sir William Heseltine, has the inside story. Why was it so important to take on the Macmillans of this world and say, I, I, I hear your advice, but I am going? It had been timed for two years before, but she became pregnant with, uh, with Prince Andrew, and so it had to be put off. And, and Krumer had been deeply disappointed. Had it come to a pinch, she would have been obliged, I suppose, to take the advice of the British Prime Minister, but she was the head of the Commonwealth, and that was very important to her. Nkrumah wanted to be friendly with the West, but also with the communist world. I remember reading, she said something like, how would it look if I didn't go? Was she aware of the kind of, the, the, the competition for influence around the world and she saw well, herself as... Plainly, she must have been, yes. But this rehearsal passed off without incident, and we gathered the tour was definitely on. And Krumah's risky strategy paid off, allowing the Queen to make her own bold move. What must surely be one of the most controversial royal tours ever made. With Nkrumah being courted by the Soviets, there were fears that he might pull Ghana out of the Commonwealth. As a constitutional monarch, the Queen couldn't get mired in politics. But she did have 11 days to try and keep Nkrumah on side. Into the sunshine of a late afternoon in Accra came Queen Elizabeth. There to meet them was Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, President of the Republic of Ghana. Chris Hesse was the President's personal cameraman. He witnessed the Queen's charm offensive in action. There's you. Yeah. Right in the front row? Yeah, yeah, yeah great. <laughs> His footage hasn't been screened for over 50 years. Now, she's meeting the chiefs and the king. Yeah. He asked a lot of questions. What sort of questions were they? She wanted to know the meaning of the headgear, the meaning of the costume. She wanted to understand right. you know, the culture. Did she seem interested? Very. Not just no, going no, no, through no, the motions. No, and she learned a lot. I 
can see in the footage, I mean, they're spending a lot of time Down together, physically close to each yeah, other. Yeah. yeah. What's she doing? What is that thing she's... Look. No, it's her back wrist. Uh, oh dear, uh, no. what's happened there? No, okay. Oh, oh. Now, where do I put this? Wrong door. Oh, and then Kwame Nkrumah has to go round. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's confusion. Yeah. She was very particular, was she? Correct. At the State Ball, Her Majesty was introduced to yet another Ghanaian tradition. The high life. No. The Queen is dancing with Nkrumah. Yeah. Did they seem comfortable with each other? She was enjoying the dance, high life music and, you know, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. The Queen's tour included a visit to Nkrumah's old school. Hey, yay! Historian Nat Nunu Amartefio was a student there at the time. Well, say yes, hail, hail, hail. We were all terribly excited to see her. I'm somewhere in there. In retrospect, do you think it was a brave decision of the Queen to come to Ghana? Because it, it is it thought was, that she put her foot down. It was a gallant decision. The Commonwealth could easily have divulged into almost a whites-only club. So it was vitally important that Nkrumah stay in to cement the loyalty of Ghana to the whole Commonwealth idea. So for Nkrumah to move out at that time would have been catastrophic for British political prestige in the world. There's an archive of Nkrumah and the Queen dancing together. Yes. You know, here was a woman whose country, whose family once represented empire, was there dancing with their president. A man could not have done it, because here is our president being respected enough by Queen of England for her to put her arms around him. And she was fairly graceful. She danced like a white woman, but a good <laughs> white woman. That's like another version of dad dancing. Precisely. The Queen had shown her resolve in Ghana, and there was no sign of the shy young monarch when she joked about the birth of Prince Andrew. Mr. President, it was a great disappointment to me when my visit had to be postponed two years ago. I hope that in due course, my son Andrew will be able to come here himself. perhaps make amends for the inconvenience he caused. <laughs> what well, we see at the end of this royal visit to Ghana is, I think, a, a much more assertive queen, a woman who's grown into her role as head of the Commonwealth. She's no longer a girl, which is how Prime Minister Macmillan is supposed to have described her. Mind you, he also noted just how absolutely determined she'd be. In 1961, the same year as her visit to Ghana, the Queen also came to India. She was here to acknowledge the country was an important and highly valued member of the Commonwealth. But forging a new relationship with post-colonial India presented an even more daunting challenge. The Queen would have to face the darker aspects of empire. This was her first visit to the country, and she was coming here, and this is important, she was coming here as head of the Commonwealth. Now that was in stark contrast to what had happened 50 years earlier, when her own grandfather had come. In 1911, George V came as Emperor of India, presiding over the Delhi Durbar, a lavish and extravagant ceremony to celebrate his coronation. See, the whole point about ruling India was not simply that it made Britain richer, but that it also gave Britain status. 
little wonder that Britain tried to cling on to its Indian Empire for as long as it could. Rebellions were crushed, political opposition was outlawed, and nationalists were imprisoned. And independence, when it came in 1947, well, that was accompanied by the violence of partition. So, by the time the Queen gets here in 1961, she's got quite a challenge. She's got to show that the past was indeed the past. The Queen was driven along what used to be called Kingsway and is now Rajpath. Her visit coincided with India's Republic Day. Now that's a moment when the country celebrates severing its ties with the British monarchy. As the guest of honour, this would be a difficult journey. The Queen was in effect confronted with Britain being forced to give up India. I hope that our visit will demonstrate to the world the respect and friendship which exists between Britain and India and indeed between all the countries which are joined together in the free partnership of the Commonwealth. Given Britain's history in the country, she couldn't have known how the gathering crowds would receive her. But any fear she may have had was soon dispelled. Two million people are thought to have turned out to welcome the royal motorcade. This joyous reception must have been a huge relief for the Queen. And it was a key turning point in Britain's relationship with India when she visited the Gandhi Memorial. Her Majesty's first official act was to pay tribute to Gandhi's memory. A few yards from the tomb, she put on velvet sandals in accord with Indian custom before walking to the place of cremation. Here, with the prince, she laid a magnificent wreath made of hundreds of roses. A beautiful tribute to India's greatest son, the Mahatma. When the Queen laid a wreath here at the memorial to Mahatma Gandhi, here she was paying tribute to the man Indians called Bapuji, father of the nation, the very man Britain had jailed on numerous occasions. Well, for us, for India, to see the Queen bowing her head at the Gandhi Memorial was very significant. For writer and journalist Jyoti Malhotra, the Queen's visit in 1961 made a lasting impression on the Indian public. She wasn't just an ordinary head of state coming to India. Here was a British Queen, the head of this former empire, but now we were not her subjects anymore. So it's a very important moment for us where she recognizes that India is a free and independent country. We're only, what? 14 years. 14 years That's right. from independence, and Gandhi had been in jail just a few years before. How come they gave her such a rapturous welcome? You're absolutely right. She does get a rapturous welcome. See, I think it came down to, she is a visitor. We will give her the respect that a visitor deserves. That's an old Indian custom. I don't think we blamed her for the evils of the empire. You have to understand what India went through for 250 years. It was a brutal suppression of the Indian people, but it wasn't really her fault that the empire had done what it had done to India. And here was the opportunity to speak of India's strengths, of our futures, of our dreams. And in 1961, when she comes, we were able to welcome her warmly. Later in her India tour, the Queen travelled over 150 miles south of the capital to Rajasthan. Within the gates of the palace of the Maharaja of Jaipur were waiting half a dozen magnificent elephants, the most splendid of them assigned to carry the Queen and her host. 
tented in gorgeous silks and brocade, the elephants epitomized Indian splendor. After paying homage to a modern India in Delhi, coming here to Jaipur was like stepping back in time to a princely India. Now, this part of the trip was private. The Maharaja and his family were old friends. They'd met back in England and shared some of the same aristocratic pursuits. Among them, a passion for polo. They were known as one of the most glamorous royal families in India. Every now and again, they would come to a father's house near Windsor Park. Uh, the friendship sort of built up. So your father, the Maharaja, mm. had a house near Windsor Park? Yes, because his polo was next door. And so there was a lot of connection playing polo. Maharaj J. Singh remembers his parents hosting the royal couple away from the limelight. When it was sort of on the cards that the Queen would be coming out to visit India, father thought that we'll try and make it a sort of private part of the visit. The press being kept away, so that appealed to them because privacy, I think, for the British royal family is a, is a great premium which they seldom enjoy. You could see the way she was talking to my parents, so the Queen just enjoyed herself for the whole time. Then there was a picnic in the jungle, everybody sat on the floor, and yeah, then, so that's the sort of thing they enjoyed. Among the aristocratic pursuits was one which would now be considered shocking. Tiger hunting. Now, I'm trying to see, where, where are you? I'm between um, my father and, and the queen. Just oh, so you're, you're there, that's your father, that's the queen, and that's you in the middle there. It's quite a difficult photo today, this animal lying in front of the shooting party. Yeah. I mean, we are talking about 1961, and it was the accepted norm. But the same area now is one of the major sanctuaries of, of uh, India. Tiger sanctuaries, yes. is that right? Yes. Now shooting all animals is banned in India. From the Queen's point of view, from India's point of view, the 1961 trip was a great success. The Queen had accepted her place at the Republic Day celebrations and been seen to embrace India's independence. She'd witnessed firsthand how this post-colonial proud nation had flourished. the Commonwealth was also growing in strength. By the 70s, it had more than doubled its membership to nearly 30 nations, and the Queen had made almost a dozen Commonwealth tours. But as the world drifted even further from the deference of empire, her visits were losing their sparkle. On a return visit to Australia in 1970, a bold new strategy was rolled out. Her former private secretary, Sir William Heseltine, helped mastermind a new charm offensive, the Royal Walkabout. So, Sir William, we've brought some archive along, and I hope it brings back some memories for you. Yeah. There'd been a heavy rainstorm, but the crowd soon forgot their soaking and the Queen and Prince Philip stopped to chat informally with a number of them. And the walkabout, it was groundbreaking territory. It certainly made for a, an entirely new sort of relationship between the Queen and, and the public. Now she was walking up the street talking to spectators on either side of the road. Was she good with people? Uh, she was immediately good at that kind of thing. Really? Yes. You weren't having to say, this is how you do it. Well, she, I suppose, told us how she was going to do it. <laughs> By now, two of her children were old enough to join in. Shortly afterwards, Prince Charles and Princess Anne flew in to join them. In the wind, Princess Anne's charming hat was to prove something of an embarrassment. Look at the wind, Katja. Yeah. Yes, yes. It was a very windy day. Reports say that Princess Anne, troubled by her hat, made some unguarded comments about the blustering wind. It was a drama because the princess was overheard to say, this bloody wind. 
felt to be quite shocking in those days. One or two of the press said she referred to this blustery wind. Oh. Well, she's got this thing training behind her, yes. uh, mm. which catches the wind. Mm. So that, that, was, was, that was a very early walkabout. Yeah. It was an obvious success. Well, you just suddenly thought, this works, and this is good yes, for, for the monarchy. This is, this is changing things forever. We hated them. I mean, can you imagine as teenagers? You know, it's hardly the sort of thing you would volunteer to do. I mean, it gets easier, but I mean, you, can you imagine? I mean, how many people enjoy walking into a room full of people that you've never met before? And then try a street. I don't think many youngsters would actually volunteer to do that. <laughs> Nowadays, of course, um, there are so many cameras around that you can't see the people. <laughs> Especially those who insist on using their iPads to do that. You can't, haven't even got any heads. So that changes the crowd structure a bit. On her tours of Commonwealth countries, the Queen has worked hard to win the hearts and minds of the public. Over the decades, the Queen's stewardship of this growing Commonwealth has made her one of the world's most experienced leaders. Politicians come and go, but the Queen has been a constant binding force. Every two years, she's taken centre stage at Commonwealth summits, where leaders from all the member nations gather to discuss everything from economics to environmental issues. This is what's so interesting, I think, about the Commonwealth. It brings together all climates and all parts of the world. You know, everybody has got a different uh, viewpoint. She doesn't take part in the main meetings, but she does have private audiences with the heads of state. Your Majesty's Prime Minister of India. Your Majesty's Prime Minister of Fiji. Come through and we can talk about uh, Fiji. Former Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke attended many Commonwealth summits. How did the Queen cope with being a woman in a very much a male-dominated world? I don't think that was an issue for her. She was a person for whom I developed an almost unlimited respect, the way she went about her business. Her uh, length of time in that um, position and her ability to uh, listen and talk to those leaders is virtually unique. She's been in that situation of being an honorary man for a very long time. You know, people get used to the fact that maybe you can have a conversation about things which they otherwise wouldn't talk to women about. It's something extraordinary about yes, this yes. generation. Yes. There are about 50 countries in the Commonwealth, and she can talk intelligently and knowingly about the politics and the economics of all of those countries. She had a lot of interests that which a lot of men shared. I mean, one big thing was horses, dry sources, and that was out of the usual. Also, a lady with a very good sense of humour. Did she ever confide in ladies in waiting? Ladies in waiting, I think, were there principally in the role of confidant, so she could complain about the private secretary, so never allowed time in the programme for her to have her hair done, all these other feminine requirements. But she wasn't hugely into feminine requirements, as you put it, was she? Having her hair done was very important. It had to be right for the tiara, I suppose, for an evening engagement. And I was criticised many times. How am I supposed to get my hair done in the time you've allowed? Despite the Queen's vast experience of the Commonwealth, in member countries, attitudes towards her can change. And she hasn't always been in step with the mood of the people. On her first trip to India, the Queen had had a rapturous welcome, and it seemed she'd put the more difficult days of empire behind her. It was very different when she came back in 1997. Then she found herself mired in controversy. 
A few hours before her arrival, a group of demonstrators headed for the British High Commission in Delhi to press their demand for a formal apology for the 1919 massacre. The Queen had returned to India to celebrate 50 years of independence. She visited Amritsar, the Sikh's holiest city, but also the scene of a shameful episode in Britain's imperial past. The Jallianwala Bagh massacre in 1919 started when British troops fired at unarmed civilians who'd gathered for a protest demonstration. In the carnage, nearly 400 people were killed and more than a thousand injured. Many in India saw this as the moment for apology, a chance for the Queen to atone for the past. The British High Commissioner in New Delhi firmly stated the monarch's position. The Queen is not going to apologise, but she is going there and she is going to lay a wreath. And I think those of you who uh, appreciate the subtle distinction will recognise it as a uh, special gesture. At a state banquet the evening before her visit to Amritsar, the Queen referred to the massacre as a distressing example of a difficult episode in our past. For many Indians, the gesture of laying a wreath was sufficient, but others expected more. What do you think had changed between 1961 and the reception the Queen got then, and what happened in 1997 when she came back? So in 1961, India was a free nation, but it was still a little bit of a new republic, perhaps. By 1997, when India was celebrating 50 years, and which is why the Queen was here, India was a more powerful nation, a stronger nation economically, which allowed us to therefore be much more critical of the former empire. So when the Queen comes to India in 1997, we are much less forgiving. And then she goes to Jallianwala Bagh which was the site of the massacre in 1919. And she describes it as a difficult episode in our history. You know, she could have just said, I'm so sorry for what happened. So, Jyoti, you was looking for one word. Just the one word. word. sorry. Absolutely. It would have been closure for one of the most uncomfortable and distressing parts of, of Indian history. She could have just said, this is your 50th year of independence and that your success is my success and our success and we have to look forward into the future. What happened on that Indian trip was a collision between the Queen's two roles, British monarch versus head of the Commonwealth, a constant balancing act. On this occasion, many felt that her role as Britain's head of state meant she was unable to apologise. For over 65 years, the Queen has been the figurehead of the Commonwealth. She's deployed tact and diplomacy, but she's carefully avoided any actions that might be regarded as political. But when her beloved Commonwealth is threatened, it turns out rules can be bent. Perhaps the biggest test of the Queen's quiet diplomacy was what to do about racist South Africa in the apartheid era. Princess Elizabeth first toured South Africa in 1947 with her family, when it was part of the Commonwealth. But political events here would stop her returning for over 50 years. In 1948, just one year after the Queen's visit, the government formalised racism and segregation under the system of apartheid. Despite hundreds dying in the fight for freedom, there seemed no end in sight. And Nelson Mandela, the political activist, was imprisoned. By the 1980s, South Africa had pulled out of the Commonwealth but many of its nations wanted to impose sanctions to force change. Margaret Thatcher, however, disagreed. 
Some feared the Commonwealth could fall apart. The Queen could not relate to apartheid. She was steeped in the Christian values and an awareness of what apartheid would do to that Commonwealth. It could destroy it. So the Queen did a quite unprecedented thing. Seven Commonwealth Prime Ministers, including Mrs Thatcher, were due to meet in London to try to agree a policy on South Africa. In a rare departure from convention, the night before that critical meeting, the Queen invited them to Buckingham Palace. There were no spouses. Dennis wasn't there, but Philip wasn't there. She did everything to demonstrate that this was a working dinner. Commonwealth Secretary General Sir Sonny Ramphal was also a guest. The Queen was clearly on the side of the Commonwealth being in agreement. That meant bringing Mrs. Thatcher around. But the Queen was not confrontational with Mrs. Thatcher. It was making the Commonwealth the issue at stake. Now, it's seven to one. What was the message? The clear message was, Margaret, you've got to allow a consensus to develop. If you don't tomorrow find a way of agreeing, you will hurt the Commonwealth immeasurably. You cannot allow that to happen. Was it understood by everyone around that table at Buckingham Palace that this was, in effect, a message to Margaret Thatcher? Oh, oh absolutely. Where she was going to be and bound to be in the minority. Absolutely. A minority of one. Yeah. She looked pretty grim. Do you think Margaret Thatcher felt she'd somehow been hijacked? Yeah. By the Queen? By her Queen. In terms of political initiatives, it was perhaps the boldest initiative of that decade. If one looks for political initiatives through the reign, they're not very common. Uh, but this was uh, um, a very bold one, I think, and, and a successful one. It would take another four years before Nelson Mandela was released from prison in February 1990. By 1995, South Africa had rejoined the Commonwealth. And after nearly 50 years, the Queen finally returned and was met by the new president. I regard the visit of the Queen as one of the high watermarks of the new democracy in this country. When he came out of prison, he knew that one of his benefactors was the Queen. In a miraculous way, messages got to him. You know how they got to him, I but you're know. not going to tell me. <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, Your Majesty, you're looking well, uh, uh, taking into account uh, your tight schedule. Uh, I'm very tomorrow I'm going to see 16 people. I may not look so good tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> President Mandela put formality aside with the Queen. Former South African politician Dr. Mampela Rampele witnessed this firsthand. He loves people, and that's why he, he made her, their relationship very informal. And people would say, "Why do you call her Elizabeth?" He said, "She calls me Nelson, so it's, it's we are friends." I remember at St. George's Cathedral, he would stop, of course, as usual, greet everybody. And, you know, she's a very shy, very retiring person. And he didn't mind. Her wait. She had to wait for him to greet people. And afterwards I said, but that, how do you let her wait? No, 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 she must learn to wait. This is, is Africa. She... <laughs> is, that, is that what he said? He really seemed to like her. Absolutely. Dr. So Rampele, many people argue that the Commonwealth is, is what it is because of the Queen, that she, she's somehow shaped it. She's had to navigate 
the end of empire mm -hmm. um, towards the Commonwealth. Do you respect that transition? More than respect it, because for a woman of her age to still be active and engaged at the level she is, she is determined. I mean, but she, she wears the determination with grace. You have rounded off quite splendidly what has been one of the outstanding experiences of my life. I shall never forget the welcome you have given us, a welcome which shows your feelings for both Britain and the Commonwealth. I think South Africa shows just what the Queen was capable of when she thought her beloved Commonwealth was under threat. She played her hand deftly and, as ever, behind the scenes. But she really was willing to push those boundaries, being bold in a way in which, well, I don't think she would at home, even when it left her being open to the charge that she was being political. Over the past 20 years, the Queen has firmly established her position as the elder stateswoman of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister of Canada, for making me feel so old. <laughs> Today's Commonwealth represents a quarter of the world's population, with over 50 countries as members. When Princess Elizabeth became Queen, there were just eight. I've been following in the Queen's footsteps and it's been fascinating watching the transformation from that slightly nervous young woman who set foot in Australia in 1954. How happy I am to be amongst you. Change into this woman who commands respect around the world. I think the Queen embodies Britain's transition from imperial power to what it is today. You know, I think that transition might have been much more acrimonious, more unsettling, were it not for what I would call the Queen's quiet diplomacy. And I think that's the unique contribution she's made to the Commonwealth. Lenny Henry investigates the complicated history with the Commonwealth this Easter Monday at 9 as he visits the Caribbean to understand its legacy and also its future. Take a peek at the trail coming up. Over on BBC Two now, time to get the grey matter working in QI. <laughs>